Okay, well, it's a pleasure to be here talking to you folks. Uh, if you're not an instrumentation geek like I am, then you may not find this too interesting, but uh, we, Tom and I have been working for many years in this field trying to measure nuclear products from uh, low energy nuclear reactions. And what has come up a number of times is, is there some way to measure trace amounts of helium? And so, for about the last year and a half, I've been thinking about this problem. And uh, what I wanted to talk about today is a, a brief summary of what we've done. And so, the question is, what's the problem? Well, the problem is that for most gas metal systems, we need to be able to separate and then quantify part per billion levels of helium in essentially pure D2. And that's difficult because the masses of helium and D2 only differ by 25 million mass units. And so most uh, water pole type mass spectrometers and those things don't have sufficient resolution to separate that. And then they also don't have the dynamic range you need because we're looking at a dynamic range of, say, pure deuterium with part per billion amounts of helium in it, so it's a 10 to the 9 dynamic range you need. And the last point on this slide, which is one that should not be uh, ignored, is that the ambient air is 5 parts per million helium. So if you're doing any, it's like kind of looking for water in the bottom of the ocean. You know? it's, a, it's a real problem if you don't do the experiments properly and, that, and if any of the constituents that go into the experiment or any of the gases that go into the experiment are ever open to air, then you've got a problem with this contamination from ambient air. So we thought about this for a little bit and uh, here are, are just a list of some masses but the two guys in the green are the two that we're interested in separating and you can see they only differ by, by 20 million, 25 million mass units. If you want to measure helium-3 the problem is much greater, much more difficult because HD molecule helium-3 and tritium all have essentially the same mass and that's really tough to separate without doing some kind of chemistry or separation before you uh, uh, try to make the measurement. So this was kind of the concept we had of how to build this thing and it's pretty simple minded to start with and you'll see it, it grows exponentially as we go on but the idea was we would inject a sample, percolate it through a couple of traps, uh, perhaps have a cleanup getter afterwards, and then just measure the helium in uh, uh, Stanford Research uh, water pole RGA. Uh, what? No, yeah, water pole RGA. So we tried this experiment, and this is what we got. Uh, this was the net helium signal from uh, 350 cc's of air at 200 torr. That's a pretty big sample of air. And we actually saw a reasonably nice signal. This curve here is the partial pressure of mass 4 as a function of time after we inject the sample. So it, you can clearly see it. And, so we got, we got all enthused and said to try to push that a little further. And what we did then, well, let me, let me back up a little. The question was whether the mass force signal we saw was due to just helium or whether it's due to helium or and deuterium. And so one of the tests that I give here is we have a, an equal mixture of helium and hydrogen that we injected into this thing. And if you look at the, the blue curve on the bottom, this is the helium signal. And here's hydrogen. This water pole has a pretty high background for hydrogen in it. But in any case, it doesn't change during the whole experiment. So I took that to indicate that if we had deuterium, the traps would hold it up also. So 
So we made several changes then to improve the sensitivity and the overall efficiency of this. First thing we did was uh, try to do the analysis for helium using a, a small magnetic sector, uh, helium light detector. And this guy has quite a bit more sensitivity and a much, much lower background than the RGA does. We also added uh, tectonics oscilloscope so we could evolve the data. Uh, the downside of this guy is it only has 8-bit resolution, but it can be operated in this high-resolution mode, which averages the signal between samples, and you can get about 12-bit resolution for that. We also added some more vacuum pumps and gauges and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and we kept the original RGA to verify that there weren't any other gases other than mass 4 getting into the into the nation. So when we run, so this is what the system looks like at that stage. We now have a, a oops, a, uh, oops, where am I going? There's a fixed volume now that we standardized on it and typically run 50 cc's at 50 torr. Uh, we have some fancy pumping stuff. Had a, a reservoir over here. At one time, that I was thinking that maybe what we would do is have all of the analysis stuff valved off. We would just let the helium diffuse through and collect in the reservoir and then look at it later. But as it turns out, we haven't used that much. So, anyway, the net result of that was this kind of a signal for helium now, which this sample is about one third of the previous sample we saw, but now the signal to noise ratio is much, much better and it's eluding a little more rapidly than it was in the other case. So we made some more improvements <laughs> and perhaps the most important one was we now measure the temperature of the sample and we have a high precision pressure gauge that measures the actual pressure of the sample so we accurately know how many moles of sample we're injecting and the other important thing is we've added an MKS microvision RGA, which only goes from zero to six mass units. And so it's got the resolution to be able to separate uh, helium and deuterium. And the third thing we added was a key site six and a half digit digital logging voltmeter. And this guy is really slick because he puts the data out into an Excel file directly and you can, uh, you can do the analysis of the data however you want. So these curves, the pictures I'll show you next are the resolution of the MKS microvision RGA and the horizontal scale is 50 times the, uh, the actual mass. So, uh, 200 would be mass 4. This is uh, uh, for deuterium here. It kind of shows you what the resolution looks like. If you put in both helium and deuterium, this is the kind of picture you get. And the issue is, of course, to me it would be very hard to make quantitative measurements even with this kind of resolution because there's a uh, tailing of one peak into the other, and you don't really have a very big dynamic range. Here's the same data on log scale, and you can see on the low energy, or the low mass side, there's tails, and you can imagine what that looks like under here for the, for the deuterium. So, uh, looks like it would be pretty tough to make measurements using this thing, although one could use it for quality assurance. Here's the same thing in the lower pressure. Now they're now they're resolved from each other dynamic range. So with the previous guy, this is now what we're what we're achieving. And this is a sample which is about a tenth or a twentieth of what the previous sample. So we're getting really good signals. The thing is, uh, whoops, is. Uh,
the helium is now eluding quite a bit more quickly than it, than it was earlier. And one of the things that has helped that is we had a molecular sieve trap originally in the thing to take out carbon dioxide, water, and most other heavy gases. And I've done away with that. We have only charcoal as a trap now. And so that lets the uh, helium uh, diffuse through a lot more rapidly than it, than it did with the molecular sieve trap in there. So OK, how are we going to calibrate the system? We have a couple of methods we can do. The one on the right here is what we most of the time use, and that is we have a standard, a standard gas, uh, which we build up, and we can fill that 50 cc sample with the different pressures and see that we get a linear relationship. And so that's what we use most of the time. The other option is to use a, a certified leak and then calibrate the leak detector to respond to that appropriately. And then if we just integrate that signal as a function of time, that also gives us a calibration, which we can use. Uh, so here's some, a few runs of the standard gas we have. And if you ignore the one in yellow, which is an outlier up, up above, then the average is about, uh, has a relative standard deviation of around 3%, and that's probably pretty good for what we want to do. So we now have the final configuration of the system which we're currently operating with, and the only difference between this and the previous one is that we've added this calibrated leak in here, and so we can make it put helium into the system at a constant rate at the same point that our regular samples go in, and that has two effects. One is we can verify that the leak, that the leak detector over here is operating properly, because we can tune it for mass four and, and for the sensitivity, and uh, that then provides a method of doing the calibration, as I mentioned earlier. And so we've kind of eliminated using the digital scope, and we do all the data with the six and a half digit Volton here now. So you heard Tom talking about the gas discharge experiments. And we can estimate uh, the amount of helium we would expect to get from these experiments. And that's sort of outlined here. His, uh, shoot, I'll get it in a minute. His, that system has about two and a half liters of gas in it and about a half an atmosphere. And the samples that we normally take out of there to analyze are, like I said, 50 cc's of 50 torr or 2,500 torr cc's of the gas, about three-tenths of the total, three-tenths of a percent of the total. Uh, of the last four or five samples that we've looked at, they've ranged from 20 to 70 parts per billion in helium with a, with a reasonable uncertainty. And that would correspond then to somewhere between 10 to the 14th and 10 to the 15th helium atoms. If this reaction was DD going to helium and the helium survived and you got all the energy out as heat, then this would represent something between uh, 2,000 to 7,000 joules of heat spread over 24 hours, uh, or would correspond to something like 20 to 80 milliwatts of power while the discharge is several watts over the same period of time. So. Yeah, it's pretty tough to say we're getting any excess heat uh, based on the helium measurements. And so uh, I have to stay tuned on this one because I don't, right now I don't think the helium is telling us that we're, we're generating a lot of, of uh, fusion reactions. So in summary, uh, we have developed a system we can measure small amounts of helium in gas samples. Currently, we can measure uh, helium in the ambient air 
to about 10% with a 50 cc sample at 50 torr. Minimum detectable amount of helium is about three parts per billion in deuterium right now. Uh, the measurement requires about an hour to complete, but then requires several hours to warm and regenerate the traps to prefer, prepare for the next sample. So you can only do a couple of samples a day, probably. Um, we have uh, about 150 samples to date, most of the samples are being standards and, and blanks. Uh, the interesting thing is that we detect helium in small amounts in almost every gas we measure. I mean, it doesn't, you know, uh, make much difference. They, they all got a little bit of helium in them. Uh, I had mentioned earlier that we had considered putting a gitter in, but uh, it doesn't really seem necessary at this time to do that. Uh, most recent standard runs have a scatter of about 5% at the one standard deviation level. The baseline measurement is equivalent to about 10 to the minus 10 atmospheric cc's per second with an uncertainty of about 30%. If you integrate that over the 100 seconds it takes for the helium to elude out, that corresponds to about three parts per billion. And so if we had a sample that was three parts per billion helium, then the signal noise ratio would be about one at that, in that case. Uh, so that's kind of where the thing stands today. And again, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, we've gotten support for most of this work from industrial heat. Uh, and that's been, that's been really useful for us. And if anybody's got any questions. How much? To do this? Yeah. Well, if, if, as you notice, we, we weren't using brand new state-of-the-art stuff. It was most of the things we could find around it. But I'm guessing to reproduce this is about $150,000. Uh, on the other hand, I've got one more slide. These guys have just brought out this fancy high-resolution quadrupole. And there's their resolution for helium and deuterium, which is really pretty good. That basic quadrupole that I showed you the picture of there, just for the piece is $150,000, and you probably need another $150,000 worth of junk to go with it to make it work. So, so now you're up to 300K. Yeah. yeah. On the other hand, if you were going to do it with a magnetic sector machine, like they have at Livermore, that's about a half a million dollars plus another half a million dollars for facilities, so it's about a million dollars for one of those. Well, so, so Malcolm, I need to talk to you about that. <laughs> <laughs> so Malcolm, isn't the helium measurement the most sensitive way to look for excess heat if okay. we're making helium? I would almost agree with that. Neutrons is really the most sensitive way to look for fusion, but Except there's no neutrons. this crowd doesn't allow you to make neutrons, so, it, so helium is the most. <laughs> Okay. Well, your work is very similar to what we want to achieve in our work, so I have a question. Sure. Uh, you said that uh, well, pressure you measure is about 50 torrs, but in our experiment, uh, our working pressure is about one torr. Uh, can we measure uh, d distinguish well, I, deuterium I, I, and helium in uh, such uh, conditions? The smallest samples that I've looked at so far have been about 10 torr in 50 cc's. And we have one torr in 400 cc's. Well, OK, so then that's not so bad. I mean, we could probably do that. Oh, I see. Thank you very much. Yeah. I wanted to talk to you more later. Yeah, OK. Any other question? To my dad? Nobody? Thanks again. Thanks.